Thank you so much for coming. It means a lot to us. It means a lot to uh, each other, I think all of you in the audience as well, because it is a user conference. And uh, I'd like to take a minute and actually think about what you're doing here together and introduce yourselves to one another. So meet someone new, because our whole mission is to empower you with data. It starts with learning about someone else. So can you take a minute and introduce yourself to someone around you? Tell them where you're from. Excellent, excellent. If you enjoyed this, if you enjoyed this uh, interaction, you have to watch out. Watch out. Oh, good, I got your attention. I just walked near a missile and I get your attention. Uh, if you enjoyed that interaction, there's many more opportunities to learn from each other. We've got the social events and a number of the tracks, so please continue to reach out and meet new people. That's what this whole week is all about, because uh, we're actually building a community. So I'd be amiss if I didn't start with data as the most important resource. Pat just mentioned about interruption of data will have an impact on your business. We've made a business over 37 years of understanding how this data is applied to your business. And if you can see these stories are just a sampling across multiple industries that help us really realize what Pat was just talking about. Being able to outscope a, a typical project, being able to work through many departments within your organization to achieve great things. Now, if you take it a step further, we look at things like big data. But this big data definition is around big value, really. And some examples here, then, around velocity, volume, and variety give us insight onto how customers are handling these complex problems of data. Taking the data in, being able to take action on it, integrate it with other tools with inside the organization, and ultimately driving value for your organization. Now, at OSIsoft, we've made a business for the last 37 years at doing this with you. And, and definitely you know as what we're working with as a historian and moving into an infrastructure, our goal has been to help you find opportunity, reduce costs, but ultimately make money. And then you share your stories with us. It's been a really great opportunity to work here and work with you to see what you are able to do. But the challenge in front of us, if we're gonna do a digital transformation, is to find new opportunities, new business models, new ways to take the expertise you might have and apply it in a new way that allows you to have a better understanding of your customer. And so, for example, yesterday, we had our client advisory board. Out of 10 groups, there's two people within that group that have already spun off a new business to look at how they can go and open up new areas and opportunities. There's another two that are thinking about doing it and sharing ideas about it. This is the opportunity while you're here this week. What are the new business opportunities for you with data? The second thing is how can OSIsoft help you with those opportunities? We're starting to do new things like you heard from Jenny. We've had in the past where we would send engineers between offices and train them on a culture and understand how different people operate. What if they came to your site and sat with you, helped you with your Pi system, helped understand how you use it, why you use it? Is it hard to manage? Is it easy to manage? What are the things that keep you up at night so we can accelerate this adoption? These are the types of things we're thinking about, especially as we look at this strategy. And this strategy is really more of the same what Pat envisioned when we started the company being able to take this data, turn it into value, but now expand it from the asset to the community. It's pretty interesting. 
So let's talk about a, a single customer that presented uh, at our Berlin seminar last year. It was really amazing because in 1999, they had their first Pi system. It was an actual OEM through Siemens. And then they bought a Pi system directly from OSI Soft, and they connected to their LIM system and the DCS. Then as we moved up in the plant, they connected it to their PIMS, ERP integration. They added an OEE application on top of it, and um, ultimately looking at MES. But they didn't stop there. In 2008, they entered into what we call an enterprise agreement with OSI Soft, a partnership to help us work together to get more value out of the infrastructure. And by doing that, they did more things on top of this infrastructure. Engineer, en en energy monitoring, excuse me, CO2 development, and device connectivity, adding more devices. And what we noticed from their presentation uh, in Berlin was a vision that they were able to share. And their vision was quite simple. It was a data architecture that said, we have the Pi system as our OT infrastructure to collect the data from whatever device we have today and any device we're going forward with that may come as part of this uh, advent of the IoT space uh, device connectivity. And in addition, they are taking this and connecting it up into their uh, business systems to actually have integration with uh, maybe SAP, Microsoft, their analytics. And then the other key thing is this customer actually showed how they want to share data through the cloud with other vendors. And we learned from them because they built this architecture on their own. What if we could have helped them and taken that 1999 system and accelerated it instead of 18 years to get to this vision? How do we do it within a year? How do we help them accelerate, and that means you in the audience, help you get faster at what you're doing? And that's where we've reorganized inside OSIsoft. The new group we've put together is sales and support as one team. One team because is something broken? No. We found an opportunity to streamline what we're already doing. If you like our support today, it's even going to get better because our support will be connected and they'll understand when they're answering a call from you, not only to solve your problem, but hopefully understand why you're using Pi and what are the problems you're trying to solve with Pi. So look forward to that. You'll talk with many of the team members throughout the organization and we're really excited to bring this customer success, not only as a strategy, but as an organization and ultimately a role that will be engaging with you to help you drive adoption. So we're very excited with this transformation. So, Christoph mentioned we're gonna have a fast-paced discussion, and hopefully you have a seatbelt there, at your, because we're gonna go fast and furious. Because Pat put out a vision, and I think it's always best to see things in action so you can take these home with you as part of this vision. So as part of our strategy, the first thing is to understand industry insights and what's happening. So we've got some, a speaker that will come up and share with you their thoughts on where the industry is going and give you some ideas around what kind of uh, pressures and or the community environment that you might be working with. In addition, we have a number of customers and partners that will be working with us to share their story. So with that, please welcome Dave Mount from Kleiner Perkins. Thanks, Martin. As Martin mentioned, my name is Dave Mount. I'm a partner at the venture capital firm Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and Byers. We're very privileged to be investors in OSIsoft, and I've had the great fortune of working with OSIsoft for the last six years since we made our investment. In addition to my work with OSIsoft, I also have the opportunity to work with a lot of other industrial software companies, to work with industry analysts, with consultants, with investment banks, and many others who are interested in this topic of digital transformation. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about the, the industry trends that are driving digital transformation, and we're gonna start that off with a bit of a pop quiz. We're gonna do some level setting. So the first question, think in, think in your mind, try to come up with an answer here, and, uh, and we'll run through this pretty quickly. But guess the number of Android phones that were shipped in 2016 worldwide. Number of Android phones, come up with that number. Got the number? 1.2 billion. 
nearly the population of all of India. The next question, the number of Dropbox users. Get that number in your mind? 500 million, more than one and a half times the population of the United States. In the first six months that Windows 10 was rolled out, it was downloaded 110 million times. Next question, the number of monthly active Facebook users. This is not the number of people who have downloaded the Facebook app, but the number of monthly active Facebook users checking in once a month. Got your number? 1.7 billion. In uh, active Netflix subscribers, at 75 million, or one and a half times the population of South Africa. And the, in the first three days that the iPhone 6S was released, it sold 13 million phones. My new favorite one, this is for extra credit, but there's a, there's a song called Hello by Adele. Not sure if any of you are familiar with it. But in the first 87 days that that song was released on YouTube, first 87 days, guess how many views it had? Anyone? A billion. A billion views of a single YouTube video in 87 days. So we are in the midst of a massive period of digitization and increased digital literacy in the world, but it's not just happening in digital media. It's happening across all of industry. Industries like power, utilities, agriculture, chemicals, the big six industries that make up the core of OSIsoft's customer base and many of the industries that you guys work in in this room. And what I find so exciting is it's not just the one third of the global economy that are digital native that are experiencing these transformations, but it's the two thirds of the global economy that are experiencing it now. And it's, it's the work that's going to be done by the group in this room that is gonna be driving that transformation forward. So suddenly though, everyone seems interested in this concept of digitization. So what is driving this interest? We'll start by, uh, the short answer is competitiveness. There's some data that's gonna show up here from McKinsey, but we also have data from PwC, from Accenture, and from many others showing that digital leaders in their market have greater revenue growth, they have higher profits, and ultimately they leave, lead to higher shareholder returns. So you bet that these types of statistics are going to drive board level conversations around digitization. Additionally, the value estimates for digitization and the digitization of industry particularly are measured in the trillions. In fact, uh, the World Economic Forum in association with Accenture came out with a report this January that the global opportunity for the digitization of industry is now 100 trillion. As though 1 trillion or 10 trillion wouldn't have been enough. I put five industry segments up here to show in aggregate some of OSIsoft's customer base, the most relevant, showing an aggregate of $3.6 trillion of potential value creation across electricity, oil and gas, automotive, mining, and chemistry, industries that I believe you all touch here. Some examples of this, ADB has announced $180 billion of potential value creation from building energy efficiency. Shell has announced it sees potential for 50% maintenance cost improvements by using uh, digitization. And there are, there are many others. You're gonna hear 72 other stories over the course of the next few days about the value of this digitization. And I put this up here to show you that while the work being done in each of your companies is terrific and worthy of all of these presentations, when you aggregate all of that together, it's almost astounding. The numbers for value creation and transformation are, are somewhat astounding. And it's only in a room like this that you can really get a sense, sense for that. So technologically though, what is driving this transformation? It's the convergence of four megatrends. The first is pervasive, tiny, and cheap sensing. Digital sensors continue to come down the Moore's Law curve and get cheaper, every, get, get cheaper and cheaper and more and more powerful every two years. Digital sensors have come down by, by around 90% just over the last five years themselves decreasing storage and compute cost. So imagine a terabyte hard drive. Imagine wanting a terabyte hard drive in the year 2000. If you could put it all together, it would have cost you about $10,000. If you wanted to go buy a terabyte hard drive today at Best Buy, it costs cost you about $40. So that scale of cost down is, is phenomenal. There are new abilities to process and analyze data using parallel computing that, that is just impossible on a single computer and ubiquitous connectivity. Cisco estimating we're going from 12 billion connected endpoints to 50 billion connected endpoints by 2020, with the large majority of that being machine-to-machine -machine communication. So these megatrends are driving digitization. They're driving interest in the Internet of Things. They're driving interest in the conversation around big data. They're driving interest in driving more and more workloads up into the cloud. And they're also putting much more of an emphasis on the value of time series data. 
And this is a lot to throw at you. So the question then becomes just how obvious is it what the next step to take is to unlock all of these trillions of dollars of value. I'm going to do this with a little bit of a survey. This is a survey that came from the World Economic Forum as well. They asked a, a couple of hundred of, of industrial IoT participants the following questions. The first question, do you understand the impact of IoT on your industry or business model? Think about how you might answer that question. Do you understand the impact of IoT on your industry or business model? 12% said yes, 88% said no. The blue line is yes. So the large majority didn't fully understand the impact of IoT on their industry or business model. Follow on question, will the adoption of IoT disrupt your industry? Is it going to happen? 72% say yes. So we don't fully understand it, but we think the disruption is coming. Final question, of those who do say yes, disruption is coming, will that disruption happen in the next five years? 77% say yes. So the next question, what will these IoT analytics be used for? The same World Economic Forum study lists the top seven of those, and you can read them here. It's a bit of an eye chart, but I'll mention the first two, optimizing asset utilization, reducing operational costs. You'll hear 72 more of those use cases over the course of this user conference, but I put these up here to show that there is a common thread among all of these use cases that plan to use IoT data, and that is the value of time series data. So, where does that put us? There's trillions of dollars of value creation potential at stake. We're benefiting from these four massive technology megatrends. There is an enormous interest in operating data that has never been more important. The data that is stored in Pi systems have never been more important than it is today. So where does that put us? It sounds to me like there are some very exciting career trajectories in this room. Certainly a lot of job security. But I, I say that uh, in seriousness. I think we're on the verge of something pretty spectacular. I think that. We are on the verge of the industrial revolution of our time, using this data to optimize processes, to generate new revenue, and to create new businesses. So that leads us to a question that I think many of you may have brought to this meeting, and a question that I have some thoughts on. That is, what is your big data strategy? If anybody brought that question to this meeting, um, we're going to tackle it now. So in the spirit of BuzzFeed, and in the spirit of the old David Letterman, uh, David Letterman top 10 list, I now bring you the top 10 reasons why OSI Soft Pi should be at the center of your big data strategy. Number 10, time series data is different and it's critical for unlocking value in IoT analytics. I mentioned that in the use cases on the, on the last slide, but as you think about a big data strategy for analytics, time series data is gonna be critically important. Number nine, scale. A billion and a half data points. Customers running the Pi system currently run more than a billion and a half data points through those systems. Number eight, reliability. OSI Soft has a 30, a 30 plus year track record of reliability. This is not a company that just figured out that operating data was interesting or just figured out that there were some specific challenges of dealing with high frequency time series data. Number seven, an engineering culture. OSI Soft Pi is made by and for the people who are doing the work. Number six, 500 protocols. OSI Soft has built and maintained a library of hundreds of protocols over the last 30 years so that when you plug the system into an asset, to a plant, to your enterprise, it just works. Number five, a customer first philosophy. The business was founded on a notion that we will never leave a customer behind. It is true and it continues to prove itself over and over again. Number four, as Jenny said, the OSI Soft Pi system will meet you where you are. It spans assets, plants, enterprises, or communities. So if you're thinking that you want to do your work with the Pi system on the edge, the Pi system is built for that. If you think you want to level up into enterprise or community level analytics, the Pi system is built for that. Number three, independence of data collection sources. The Pi system works just as well with any manufacturer or OEM or any mix or combination of any manufacturer or OEM as a neutral data platform. And I think that's important. Number two, is not just independence of data collection sources, but also independence in terms of data consuming applications or IoT analytics connected service platforms. Just as important to have that neutrality as you go and feed all sorts of different new analytics or business models. And number one, context. Once again, as analytics are moving into the realm of big data, moving into the realm of advanced analytics, that sounds to me like you're moving from working on a specific asset to working on a plant level, a an enterprise level, or eventually a community level. And if you are going to do that work, you need to have a consistent definition of what your assets are and what events you are looking for. 
OSI itself delivers you that capability with the asset frameworks and event frames, and it's, it's critically important. If you want a slide to see what this looks like, and I'm wrapping up now, if you want a slide to see what this looks like, I'll show it to you here. On the bottom, you've got your control systems, your sensors, your millions of assets, your hundreds of different protocols feeding up into that neutral OSI soft data infrastructure. There, the information is organized, it's contextualized, and with the help of the asset framework, it's turned into a single source of truth for all the rest of your monitoring and big data analytics and applications. I don't have time to get into this now, but sending bunches of streams of time series, raw time series data straight up into a data lake is a recipe for heartbreak. I can talk to you about that at length. I really don't have time to talk about it now, but if you want to discuss that, find me afterwards, find me at some point this week, and I'm happy to go through it. Organized, secure, contextualized data is the basis for unlocking all of the value of these industrial analytics. And the OSI Soft Pi system, as the information infrastructure for the operating world, is the system that is at the foundation and will be the launch point for those new successes. So now, that's a lot to throw at you. That's my read on the market. It's an exciting time to be in your position. I know the team at OSI Soft is really fired up to spend the time with you this week to talk about ways that you can use this data that has never been more interesting if, to find new ways to generate revenue, to find new ways to generate productivity, and see where it goes. I'll now hand back to Martin. Thanks. Thanks uh, you're not leaving. OK. Yeah, I, I, sorry. David, uh, I, I'm sorry I, I couldn't let you leave the stage. Uh, okay. Because not only do you give us a perspective, how many people are trying to write a business case right now, and they like those 10 lists? You can get a picture with Dave in that list of 10 items. You didn't have to take a photo of it. And uh, he can sign it with you on the, on the way out in the lobby. But uh, the good part is it's the support like this when we see from an outside perspective that is so helpful. And uh, definitely a believer. So thank you, David. Yeah. Pleasure. Mark. As I mentioned, we want to do this fast-paced kind of introduction. We had over 30 entries into examples of what we're about to show you along this journey. And we had to cut them down because there were so many. But why were there so many? Because we've been at this for 37 years, and we just became popular. Yes. We're ready to go to prom. We're ready. The greatest thing ever is this assets uh, discussion. And here at the show, we've actually got a partner community that have band together, and there are more coming, that have actually wanted to be part of this IoT focus. Uh, so I know Pat doesn't truly believe in it yet. We have to show him how it works. But here are a number of the partners that are working with us uh, in the showcase. Here are some examples that you'll see. And how many of you have a have some sort of scenario where you need a sensor to bring the data back and put it into the Pi system. Here's a lot of examples you'll see in our showcase. One example as well is a new release we've done with uh, Cisco. Cisco has an iOS and IOX platform that allows us to run our connector sitting on the router. It then can be distributed throughout your enterprise at remote sites. It's got compute and routing capability all in one, and I wanted to bring Andrew Scott from Barrick up to share us his story and how he's deploying this. So Andrew, please join us. Thank you, Martin, um, and thank you everybody for being here. It's, it's a great turnout, and, and I love coming to these conferences. So first off, I want to say we are an uh, enterprise uh, um, agreement customer for the last three years, and we've enjoyed the whole journey very much so. So I want to thank Pat, thank Jenny, and the whole of the OSI team for the, all of the support that they've given us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of uh, the story of, of, of Barrick um, and where we are at. We, like everybody else, are on a digital transformation, thanks to some very good um, consultants and friends and partners and what have you. So, but the thing about it is we haven't been, this journey's been a long time, uh, we've been on this journey for a long time. So back when we engaged with OSI to have set up our enterprise agreement, we believed that we needed to get a solid foundation of, for what was coming at us. So part of that solid foundation was to, to uh, allow us to and I want to thank Dave for his presentation because he set me up perfectly. Because he painted a picture that we saw a number of years ago and that we needed to have this solid uh, um, framework 
to be able to take advantage of all the new things coming down the pipe. The other thing is, now I'm more involved now in our innovation strategy, so we've got a good solid uh, foundation happening. And we see that solid foundation as being the platform to allow us to take advantage and be as an innovative company as we possibly can, to lower our costs, uh, to, to realise new business models, as Martin uh, highlighted before, uh, and really take advantage um, of the new technology that's coming through. So we believe in this, uh, in this infrastructure. Now I want to just walk you through a, a, a story that we've, uh, we've been um, on a journey with. So I was glad that, uh, that Martin highlighted the Cisco 829, because we do believe that this is a really good solid pl um, platform with compute, storage, on the edge, that we can take advantage of. Now, one of the things that, uh, that we in mining uh, are plagued with uh, to, to date, uh, but things are changing rapidly, is that a lot of the technology that we have developed or, or um, implemented at our mine sites is relatively low volume. And what that means, though, it, what that means is that it usually costs a lot of money. So what we're trying to do is to drive our costs down, is take advantage of, of consumer grade and uh, applications and technologies that's used across multiple industries so that we can take advantage of that lower cost, but also we can take advantage of the learnings and the improvements that are made in other industries. So to give you an uh, example, uh, we worked with our partner, OSISoft, uh, Cisco, my, most of you probably know that we have formed a, a fairly strong partnership with uh, Cisco. And we, there's another uh, partner that I've got up here, or, or um, a company that we've worked with, who provided a hardware and loop uh, simulation circuit to allow us to test uh, the 829 um, to feed data. Now, I want to also highlight on this, we are developing our own software. We have what we call our code mine. And it's de developing applications to meet our, uh, our needs uh, and develop. So we need a platform to be able to leverage uh, those applications. And so we see the, uh, the, the, the applications and hardware solutions like the Cisco 829 as providing that capability. So, and, and if anybody has any further questions or, or wants to know more about what we're doing, please find me or any one of the, the Barrick team. We do have quite a number of people from Barrick here and uh, at the conference, so please reach out to them. Now, one of the things, as part of our innovation strategy, one of the things that we were focusing on, amongst a couple of other uh, key streams, but the one I want to point out to you is this absolute integration. Why is this important to us? What we want to do is work more closely with our partners. We want to work closely with our communities. And so the absolute integration piece is fundamental. And so technologies like the, the, uh, the platform that OSI has provided us enables us to do some of this great work. So with that, I, I want to welcome you to the conference. Enjoy um, and learn as much as you possibly can. And if you've got any further questions for me, please come and find me. Thank, Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you. One point I, I want to, when I talk to Andrew about this, I go, why did you go do this? What was interesting about it? And he said to me, he said, you know what? If I can go remotely put a connector out on an asset and then reliably bring that data back with context, it will automatically build the context inside our enterprise agreement. And it lowers the cost of having to do maintenance between the assets. And I thought that was really compelling, especially if we think about our strategy from asset to plant to enterprise. And many of you are sitting there right now because you've seen these drones and you've seen this missile. And you're thinking to yourself, well, we just left asset. Now we're moving to plant. What is he going to do with these? Just wait because there's community coming. Uh, with the idea of plant, I wanted to bring up some other folks that have helped us partner in the plant area where we've made our name for a long time. But what we've also done is started to innovate with these partners. So if I could, I'd like to invite Vice President of North America from Emerson, uh, Nathan Pettis, up and join me on stage. This is yours. All right, good morning. I'm really thrilled to be here. Martin asked me to come about three weeks ago, and I had to choose between Wang, Wangzhou, China, or San Francisco. 
So I chose San Francisco. I was talking to Martin uh, this morning, actually, about when he started OSI. I started Emerson in 1998. I think you said 2002. So actually, Emerson and OSI have been working together for longer than he, either I or have him have been at the companies. Actually, the first thing I did for Emerson, I was a software developer. The first task, I was thinking about this last night, the first thing I did while I was at Emerson was integrate our OEM enterprise, I'm uh, sorry, our OEM uh, Pi Data Storing with our batch software. So I've been working with uh, OSI software for about 16 years and Emerson even longer. So it's been a good partnership, but it's basically been up to this point kind of a technical partnership, uh, sort of a vendor supplier kind of a relationship. It's starting to morph, and I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. And there's a reason, and the main reason I think is because of you. Our customers, we have a lot of common customers, particularly in the process automation solution industry, are asking us to help them leverage their investments that they've already made for years in a way they haven't before, either through uh, fleet agreements or enterprise agreements. But frankly, between Emerson and OSI, we have a lot of the data. And I think that's probably one thing that has kept us working together for so long. Both companies do believe data is king. Data is king, and that is how we untap the infrastructure that we've all spent money on, whether it's in the field or at the enterprise level. So I want to talk a little bit about why we would do a digital transformation. Actually, Pat sort of already talked about this. It's not because, well, maybe some of us are geeks and some of us just like to play around with toys and tools, but mainly it's because we need to do better. We need to make more money. I would have a premise. I would bet every single person in this room in the last year has had a conversation with either someone who works for them, works with them, or their boss. In my case, my wife. I need you to do more this year with less. Do everything you did last year, but I need 10% less budget. Do everything you did last year, but your team is now four people, not five. That is the nature of the market. We have to become more operationally efficient. And at Emerson, we've talked a lot to our customers, Shell, BP, Pfizer, about how they can become more operationally efficient. Martin showed the slide earlier about saving costs, getting more profit. We call that operational certainty. It's the process of getting to the top quartile. You slice every industry, you slice your peer groups into 25% quartiles, you want to be in the top quartile. And what we found, talking with many, many different, you know, many different, actually like McKinsey, other, other IHS, uh, ARC, lots of different industries, KPIs, that if you moved every company in one of these four areas, production, how we make things, safety, reliability, energy, from third fourth, third, second to the top, the industry could save a trillion dollars. So it's not 100 trillion like Dave bragged about, but it's still a big number. And whether you believe it or not, it's calculated basically if you take a company, XYZ company, and you find out that they're spending $500 million a year on maintenance costs, for example, either through digitization or other things, they could spend $250 million because that's what the top quartile customer spends, less. You add all that up across these four pillars, a trillion dollars. That's why you would transform your business digitally. So how do you do it? Well, I think there's three things. You need people. Actually, that's probably the most important thing. Process. And of course, technology, you have to have an ecosystem. Everyone has to have an ecosystem. So we have one called the Plant Web Digital Ecosystem. But I think what you, eh, it's maybe not unique, but what we do believe is it is an open partnership-based ecosystem. Companies like OSI and Emerson work together to deliver best-in-class data and infrastructure because I don't think any one company can ever do this by themselves. We obviously believe that data at the bottom, the sensing layer, is very, very important. Data integrity is very important. All the best analytics in the world aren't going to work if your sensor says it's 50 degrees but it's really 75. You need to have a secure transfer between the field and the, OT, the, the gate, the edge. So we'll talk a lot about gateways this week. I'm sure we have one in the Expo Center. We have field networks, and our customer says, do not compromise the field. So there's a field gateway. Then there's an edge gateway. 
So we've worked with OSI and Dell, two of our partners, to build a gateway in the edge that connects to one of our secure Yheart at field gateways, and they automatically pull data out without any work, securely. So that's a secure first mile. So you get the data, get it up securely, now you start getting into the aggregation layer. That's where OSI really has tremendous advantage and where we leverage. And so we've developed three applications. All can be seen at the Expo Center. I'm not going to talk about them in a lot of detail, but they all leverage Pi's data archive and their asset framework to give the context to the data. One around equipment health, baseline it, statistically figure out when there's an outlier, red, yellow, green, on a compressor, on a heat exchanger, on a boiler, take predictive action. One on efficiency, so these are ASME sort of first principle models built again with context, reciprocating compressors, cooling tower fin fans, all of the kind of assets you might have in your facilities, tell you whether they're working efficiently or not, allocate the load across three boilers based on which one's more efficient, et cetera, and then energy. So these are three applications that we've built on the infrastructure that OSI provides us. And here's one customer, last slide, that took advantage of those three cut their operator rounds down by 67%. That's two-thirds of the time someone's not in the field to get hurt. Increased their throughput by 20% and saved $12 million a year. What's most important to this slide, though, is not that they actually leverage those three applications. It's this great quote in the back, because that's what I think customers are all saying. Help me unleash the millions of dollars that I've already spent over the last 10 years on this infrastructure to make my company more efficient. And they did it. Sure, they probably added a few sensors. Sure, they probably added a few OSI tags. I don't know if they're on an enterprise agreement or not, but I'm sure they added some. But for the most part, what they did was change the way they work and had their people do something different, leveraging the technology to save $12 million a year. And in the end, that's what this conference is about, in my opinion. We're all here to do this, but we have to go back as people change the way we do things and leverage this digital transformation to help our companies make more money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. What, one point I'd like to make is you, you look at it and you say, oh, Emerson's is up there, they're another vendor. But this is the key piece. Our transformation is Emerson's a customer of ours. We're actually embedding our technology within to do things we're not going to do, which is the applications you just saw. And now I'd like to introduce Ted Hill, Director of Product Management from Rockwell. Hello, Ted. Hey, there you go. Uh, good morning. I'm with Rockwell Automation, and uh, we've partnered with OSI for, Martin, close to a decade. Um, we embed their storage technology in a number of products in our portfolio. We're really principally known as an automation company, but over the last few years, we've really refocused our company on helping our customers achieve their own version of a connected enterprise. And a lot of that involves moving data from the intelligent devices that are sitting in their operations and moving that data seamlessly through their organization to the people that need it in a way that's meaningful to them. We talk about our portfolio in the context of integrated control and information. So we talk about our integrated architecture, that's our multidiscipline automation system built around logics, our intelligent motor control, and then the solutions and services that we can work with our customers and partners um, through the people that we have. There's been a lot of talk lately around IT, OT convergence, and somebody this morning, I think it was Pat, said that we're finally the cool kids, the people that own and manage and have access to all of the OT data. What has changed is people expect to have access to it now. Part of it's just driven from the expe expectations that people have from their consumer experience, where access to any information is available to them when they want it, wherever they are, on whatever device they happen to be using. Well, getting data and information out of OT systems is hard. Part of it is because they've been there for a long time. Um, looking at the audience today, I'd suspect that Many of you have been involved in deploying automation systems more than 20 years ago that are still working today. So our best customers are dealing with infrastructure that's literally 
uh, might span from today to a generation ago. So if you think of an automation system that was uh, designed 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, it was designed to minimize communications because the communication band that, width that was available was critical for the control function. It was, it was designed to minimize how much data was stored because we didn't have the ability to store it. Storage was precious. Um, we often joke on the OT side that we create or birth all of the data that's what's interest to people, that they want to do the analytics on. But a lot of the traditional uh, automation systems, that data came into the system through some form of I.O. It was used for a single scan to make a decision, and then it was thrown away because we didn't have the compute capability to take advantage of it. We couldn't store it. Well, all of that's changed. What we decided for our strategy around ITOT convergence was to leverage industry standards. So we've adopted unmodified Ethernet as the backbone of our architecture. We've decided to work with partners like Cisco and Microsoft and OSI on how to build up the ability to seamlessly move that data that's sitting in our smart devices. The devices in our portfolio and our partners' products they have compute capability built in. They have analytics built in. There's just a tremendous value of information there that we need to have flow through our system. We're very focused on having a scalable solution. Um, many of you, uh, even if you don't have your core automation system built around Rockwell, you probably have Rockwell kit coming in on process skids or on equipment that you're buying from an OEM. So we want to be able to do the data analysis the compute capability, where it makes the most sense in the architecture and where it's going to have the most value to our customers. We've been working on a new edge analytics device for the last year that is designed to attach to your network and self-discover all of the intelligence devices that are there, pull the data and the information that's available from them, and surface it to the people in the organization that can have the most value from that information and take action on it. Uh, an early customer we've been working with uh, is called Great Lakes. If anyone here is from the Midwest, they're a very popular uh, brewery. Um, if you have a little time in the airport on the way home, their Dortmunder Gold is excellent. But they're in the business of brewing beer. So anything we can do to ensure that their automation system never goes down, or when their automation system does go down, that we can minimize the amount of time it takes them to figure out what's wrong and take corrective actions, tremendously valuable to them. I've been working with development teams for more than 20 years, and I know there's a lot of uh, data scientists here, but statistically, it's a little surprising to me when every time we need an early adopter customer, the development team always knows some brewery that would just be the perfect candidate to work with. <laughs> so I have a short video to show of just some of the work we've been doing with Great Lakes. Microtalk Analytics for Devices allows these assets to become system aware, where data can be aggregated up, analyzed, and presented to you no matter where you are, no matter what device you have. If you really want an approachable way to start your journey on analytics, this is for you. If you really want to know how your devices are performing with a rich set of analysis on top and a great easy to use approach to interacting with your data, this is for you. And it's all delivered on an industrial appliance ready for any environment. To explain how we're doing industrial analytics differently, we often use an analogy to fitness trackers. My wife and I use pedometers, but as end users, we don't interact with the raw data you see here. Instead, our fitness trackers present their data like this. Analytics have been applied. Data has been shaped and aggregated and married with outside sources. This visual representation makes it easy for me to use, and I can glance at the information to make better decisions. We know that every minute you spend configuring our products is a drain on productivity. So we set out to make this product as easy to use as possible. Factory Talk Analytics for Devices comes on this industrial appliance. All you need is power and ethernet, and then you answer a few simple questions about security, time zone, and what language you speak. And that's it. This appliance is ready to use. After the appliance is configured, it will detect the Rockwell automation devices in your network, gather the onboard diagnostic information, and automatically perform analysis on the data, all in a matter of minutes. Now that we've seen how easy it is to configure, let's take a look at how easy it is to use. Here are intuitive device dashboards, and while many dashboarding systems exist today, the fact that these were done automatically is where the real value is. 
Not only are glanceable, informative dashboards important, but if there is an issue, we want to make sure the information gets to the right person. So we've created what we call action cards. And like the rest of the system, they are easy to use and they are smart. Either from their desktops or from their phones, they can go into the screen that shows these action cards. Each item that requires their attention is listed. And as our system gets smarter, we will even start to tell them what they should do to fix the issue. So in a period of a couple of minutes at Great Lakes, um, our factory talk analytics for devices uh, found more than 100 um, smart devices sitting on the network. It identified 23 um, potential issues that the maintenance team or automation team really needed to take action on. Um, we have some OSI storage technology built into that edge device so that over time we can see how those devices are behaving and working as a system. So we're, pr we're pretty excited about that and we'll be coming out with it next quarter. Um, the, the last slide I wanted to end on was just talk about a number of places in our architecture where we uh, are working with OSI. So we have uh, OSI storage that sits on a card that will go in our chassis with logic. So that might come to you if you were a process customer on a skid. Uh, we have the ability to seamlessly move that data up to a plant level historian and then using things like Pi Connector, move that up to enterprise um, Pi. And one of the comments that Pat made uh, earlier this morning that's really important is we need to move that data with context. Uh, data on its own is meaningless. We need to have context about where that data is coming from and what was happening around it for it to be meaningful to our customers. Uh, Martin, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it, Ted. Um, big round of applause. Thank you. I'll keep that real quick. I'll keep it. Uh, now, uh, why I, I want to keep Ted on just for a minute is talk a little bit about what, what our strategy has been. We need partners at the asset and the plant that are embedding Pi. And the commitments we're making, they ship about 2,000 Pi systems a year in their embedded products. And we're looking to almost do 10 times that together. But what's in it for you, the end user? And, and Ted just discussed it. It's really being able to auto-connect up into your enterprise systems. And that's why that architecture is so important. So Ted, thank you so much for your, your partnership, your strategy, and we're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to a great week. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so we're making our journey. Now we move into the enterprise because Ted's kind of shown how we would grow the uh, connectivity. But let's talk about the problem set. You've seen two automation vendors that are embedding the Pi technology really to solve the problems at the plant and maybe an asset layer. But at the same time, how are we able to do this at an enterprise layer? Because we have automation vendors, we have new servers and or IT technology, and of course, remote and mobile assets. And what we want to do is not just let those go right up to the cloud, because is that really going to be the most valuable? Because what you've just created is a bunch more stovepipes. And we've, we have built a business on taking those stovepipes and putting them in a single infrastructure and allowing you to have complete visibility and expand the scope of what you're able to do. And you saw this slide from Dave sharing really how we see enabling all of this in the enterprise. So um, one mention here is that we reached a global glo goal last year of 160 enterprise agreements. We had over 30 enterprise agreements signed last year. We're seeing a huge trend in this partnership where we're working with the automation vendors and the IT vendors to help you in the plant. But what people are realizing is this vision can really drive value across your enterprise. So thank you so much for your commitment in us. And we look forward to adding this over time. So now a use case in the enterprise. And one of this use cases is, is a little different because you almost think of yourself, how many of you run a port today? Not many of you. And this port is actually in India. And um, we are going to hear about them in a user track. And we thought it was so interesting because if you think about the vision Pat painted around a community and how we get there, a port is one of those. So um, you're going to be able to see a Donnie Ports at their talk, and uh, Yogi Barand is here with us today. He'll be able to speak with you. I just wanted to share his use case with you. Thank you, Yogi, for traveling all the way from India. So, Yogi, you basically have a company that has 12 billion in revenue. You have resources, logistics, and energy, assets amounting to about 9 billion, and ultimately you've got sensors and actuators throughout your facility. 
You then built a vision that says, okay, these assets are applied across different business units, and these business new units are here. So you're a conglomerate, not just owning a port, but you have energy, you have gas, you have logistics. Uh, very complicated problem. We engaged with you about five years ago to really uh, uh, help on the port side. So if you see inside the port in the second level, in their vision, you see a little pie system. And we've been working with them for about five years on this vision. But their vision was so interesting because now they're thinking of themselves as a smart community. So we started with an enterprise rollout, helping look at assets that are mobile, which would be tugboats, and helping them with fuel management, logistics, and health and safety. But if you build out their architecture and vision a little further, they also need to integrate with big data analytics, logistics systems, uh, GIS from Esri, and it gets really interesting with the, the vision they have. And we were lucky to participate in this vision. And so here's a, a look at their architecture. Ultimately going after the tugboat and looking at the assets around fuel management and on the um, ability to do health and safety and logistics. They built their core site displays, can view into them. And they ultimately came out with a, a two-year ROI on, and paying back for this project. But here's the scope. The vision we've just got shared by Adani is quite large. And the scope increases, so I think it's important to partner. So we laid the foundation of the infrastructure, and on top of that, we put the Esri uh, GIS operational dashboard. So now that we don't just look at the asset as a single trend, we can now look at location and do analytics across their whole supply chain, across their health and safety. And it's really brought this value back in a two-year payout. So if you think of us in the enterprise, a standalone value with the Pi system, but then when we start partnering with enterprise applications, uh, it becomes compounded. Um, and I'd be amiss if I wouldn't introduce uh, Chris Capelli from Esri. He's joined us to talk a little bit about our partnership together in that space. So please welcome Chris Capelli from Esri. Okay, uh, hi. I'm, I'm not an engineer. I'm not an IT uh, expert, so I apologize ahead of time. I, I looked at the demographics of the pie chart. Was that accurate? Because if it's going to floor you when I say I'm a geographer, <laughs> I, I, I knew it. So that's what, that's what my friends in college said when I switched majors from physics to, to geography. They gave me a coloring book in crayons and said, <laughs> they, they said, stay in the lines. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that meant. Um, so I figure that we probably ought to redo the demographics of this room, actually. Because I don't believe that, well, I know you're engineers and IT experts and operational efficiency masters, but I also have a hunch that you're a geographer as well. So here's my test. How many of you live somewhere? <laughs> Is that 100%? <laughs> okay, good. Well, you're a geographer. You made a series of, of location analytic computations in your mind, or your significant other significantly helped you <laughs> to influence those decisions. But you are now a geographer. Do you understand what I'm saying? You consider cost surfaces. How much is it going to cost? How much does it cost to live here versus there? How, much, how close am I going to be to work? How close am I going to be to play? How much is it going to cost me to move around that surface of where I live? So you, my friends, are now officially geographers as well. But I'm not going to tell you to stay in the lines, because geography is a powerful science. And when applied in a business context, it can change the way you look at your business, it can change the way you plan for business, and it can frankly give you insights that help advance your business beyond your competitors. Because that's what we really call the science of where. Now, my colleagues and I have been in business for 48 years. Now, I've only been with the organization for 26, so I'm quite a, a geographic geek, as you might say. Because maps, of what I found throughout my, my career, is maps are important because they tell stories that you would not otherwise see right in front of you. Does anybody see that map right there? What do you think? It, do you recognize the geography? Can you name any of the countries? Japan? Yeah. What's that other country just to the left of Japan? Imagine if uh, an organization like that or a nation state like that had submarines 
and they wanted to evade your detection, but they didn't have sophisticated electronics. Imagine that that is what that map shows you. Where would they hide? Imagine now if I could apply that same science to your business and tell you where are the issues hiding for you? Where are the areas that you may right now be blind to that by putting them on a map and understanding how location is coincident but also starts to unlock the connectivity within your organization's data and show you something new? Because that's the power of the science of where. Now, really, geography and GIS are, are more than just technology. They're more than just a simple uh, pursuit of applying technology in business. GIS provides an entire framework for helping you understand all of your data and bring it together based on its location. So imagine collecting all of the meter readings, all of the sensor readings, all of the asset information based on where that asset is, and be able to see it and other assets that are near it in that same context. That's the first thing you would do with a GIS system. Put your things on a map. Connect to virtually any other system or data source and see it on a map. The second thing you would do is you'd probably visualize and make a map. Those maps may flow around your organization. Those maps may flow outside of your organization. They may be the way that you collaborate with other people. Now, if you're starting to get advanced, which most organizations really desire, you start to do analysis and modeling from those maps. Because now you're looking for that same set of trends that are going to help you make decisions, just like when you made a decision about where to live. But imagine doing that in your business. Why are sensors failing, or why are sensors being disrupted in this area? Why am I seeing a pattern? Is geography a relevant characteristic that I need to consider? How do I move my goods and services quickly across the surface to meet to the de demands of the customers that you're trying to serve? How do you optimize and design where you're going to put your next sensors so that you're measuring the correct things to give you a, a thorough and accurate read on your network? This is really what geography and GIS does. Because ultimately, all of us in business want to do better planning and design. We want to make the right decision as fast as possible and we want to move as quickly to action as humanly possible. That's what a GIS system is in organizations. It provides a new level of context for your Pi system, allowing you to understand where things are and why and how they're connected. Now, I thought I'd give you a few ideas on how you could leverage the Pi system with GIS to accelerate your business. And I know there's a series of dimensions that you operate in, so I picked a few. You could start as simply as I just want to map things. Where are my assets? Where are the different things that I'm interested in? What is my local geography of my business? That's a very simple thing. Doesn't cost a lot of money. Doesn't take a lot of time. You may also want to enable your mobile workforce to be more effective. Route them to those things that you care about. Route them more effectively. Reduce wear and tear on your trucks. Understand and give them alerts so that they're safe as they enter that area of your asset. Next, as Martin has said all morning, collaboration is key. Collaborating with the rest of the organizations in your ecosystem, whether those are inside of your network or outside, is actually something that all businesses and governments are looking to do more effectively. Maybe that means getting information from the local government or the national government that you're within. Maybe it means also supplying them with information so you can be compliant to their laws and regulations. Of course, there's operational intelligence, and Martin already showed an example of that with a dashboard, being able to understand where and what is happening in near real time. There's also building focused geographic applications. Hey, how many of you are new to this area? How many of people are not from San Francisco? I know I'm not. How many of you went to Yelp to find your restaurant? How many of you went, didn't use Google Maps? See, those are focused applications that use geography you may need some similar kinds of focused applications. And GIS provides a framework for you to build those applications so that you can geographically power your organization's workforce. And last but not least, boy, I love this focus on analytics, Martin, because I'm a computational geographer, if you haven't figured it out yet. So mixing computers and this notion of geography, man, I could do that all day. So let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Because when you look at location analytics, Think about it as giving you new languages 
for understanding where and why things matter. So it's understanding where things are, put them on a map. It's measuring size and shape and distribution so you can not only see, but you can get accurate measurements. It's determining actually how places are related. Why does your spouse like the, your house or why does your, your kids like the, the park? Understanding being able to determine that actually computationally at business speed has become most important in enterprise organizations. Maybe you're into supplying and you need to find the best path or route to deliver your goods and services, or you're a network provider using a grid to deliver power. You need to understand where do I build that new station so that I can optimize delivery and lower costs, detect patterns and quantifying uh, results, and making, of course, predictions, one of my favorites. So my challenge to you is consider using the Pi system with GIS to go predictive. Here's an example of predictive incident analytics, which looks at a variety of different data sources to see and make better decisions proactively. And that's the power of location and the Pi system. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I have a surprise for Chris, uh, since he was able to come and, and talk a little bit about how we're working together. I was inspired when I saw the the use case from Adani. The one thing I'd think about, what if we were involved a little bit more together, working together to do exactly what Chris talked about against their vision? And that's where we're aligning on the customer success route is that we can work very closely to drive that. Here's an example. We wanted to go out into the market, talk to two customers, and have them give us some use cases and see what we could do to innovate around them. So the first example, I'd like to bring up a long-term partner uh, Steve Hanewald from Power Factors. Please join us. Good morning. Uh, my name is Steve Hanewald from Power Factors. Uh, about four years ago, Power Factors and OSISoft partnered to create a, um, uh, a performance portfolio uh, management system, SaaS based delivery, and it's for the clean power industry. And one of the clean power asset classes you know, of course, is solar. And solar is very similar to the other power generation asset classes when it comes to operations and maintenance, but it's actually different in a couple ways. And there's three ways in particular that it's different that creates an operational challenge that the Pi system and their partners can really help the industry. That's in the area of velocity, volume, and cost. In the area of velocity, the typical solar power developer is bringing on from 100 to 500 plants per year. That's a lot of data that has to come into the system and be integrated into the overall asset framework. So that creates a lot of challenges. The second, though, is volume. This may be surprising to you, but the typical solar power plant on a per megawatt basis actually uh, has five to 10 times more data being monitored than a coal power plant of the same capacity. Uh, and then finally, cost is a big problem. If you look at a typical fossil plant, 70, 80% of the production cost is fuel. Well, fuel is free for solar. It's all about labor. And unfortunately, in solar, the developers sold it as a no maintenance asset. So we have a very, very small O&M budget. So taking all that, I'd like to present the challenge to my friend at Emerson. How about driving not 67% out of operational rounds, but 100%? So I gave that challenge to OSIsoft and to their partners, and we're gonna show you a little video of how do we combine our operational performance data, geospatial data, thank you, geospatial data, and, am I on? Geospatial data and um, uh, aerial thermography. Now you see why we have the drones. So let's see what we came up with here. Very exciting. To tackle the industry challenges stated, a drone is deployed to survey the solar farm. After the site survey is completed, from the imagery captured, AeroVironment Decision Support System, AVDSS, automatically builds out a data model and integrates with asset management systems with a high degree of sensitivity down to the solar module level. 
Here's an example of a solar farm data model automatically built out into a Pi Asset Framework hierarchy for large assets. The Pi Point data streams with the geospatial information can both be visualized on Esri GIS. This integration of data is what makes this solution so powerful and helps solve industry challenges. You can see the map location blocks and the representation down to the solar array. Now let's take a look at a specific use case. How would I diagnose a crack on a solar panel? How do I identify and replace a batch of faulty solar panels? I'm an operator from Sol One Solar Farm and notice generation is way down. And this is an issue because I recently signed a power purchase agreement with a local municipal utility company to provide 250 megawatts. After confirming the loss in power on the Pi Coresight display, AVDSS application will update a feature layer that will identify the problem area. Immediately, I see the solar panels in red that are causing the generation loss. Clicking on the pop-ups show the imagery picked up by the drones. From the infrared camera, I see there is a hotspot on the panel. An additional photo shows that there is a crack. And just to confirm that this crack is a critical issue that requires the dispatching of a technician, you quickly navigate to the Pi Coresight pop-up configured for that particular solar array and confirm the data loss is significant. This technology replaces inefficient manual ways of locating bad solar panels with a more automated approach. Yeah, so it's pretty spectacular. My calculations show that this will reduce the cost of finding operational performance issues in a solar array, and some of these are 100 square miles in size, by five to 10 times lower cost. So again, the combination of operational data, geospatial, uh, aerial thermography, transmor transmor uh, transformative in the industry. Thank you, Thank Martin. you. Thank you so much, Steve. Awesome job. Wow, Steve. Just in case, I have another microphone. If I call someone from the audience, you know who you are. Honestly, you also want to check under your seats because we're going to fly the drone in a minute, and there's a helmet to protect you. <laughs> so that was one use case, Chris. What would you think? I, it was amazing, and it actually just shows the power of putting Pi on the map. Pi on the map and automatically building the assets together. Uh, just phenomenal. And great work with this team that helped us do it. So what, what, what I heard um, Steve summarize was really reduced O&M cost, efficient dispatch of technicians, and improve availability and reliability. Really cool stuff. And really the three-way of an IoT asset, like a drone, putting it into the Pi system, and then driving it up into an Esri map. Great partnership. I hope that was pretty innovative for you, but there's one more challenge. So now that we've got this data and we're doing asset management, wouldn't it be interesting to look at emergency response? So we made a challenge with our colleague from Semper Energy, and I'd like to introduce Patrick Lee to come from, he's the VP of major projects at Semper Energy. Good morning. Yeah, actually, Martin got my title wrong. I actually starting this week, my vice president of infrastructure and technology for Semper Energy. So I, I change jobs a lot. So. This is my number 17, actually, in, uh, in my career in 26 years. So Semper Energy runs a number of electric and gas utility in California and also in South America. And personally, I have actually spent more than 20 years working in San Diego Gas Electric and Southern California Gas Company, mm -hmm. our California utility companies. One of the most challenging problems running a utility is emergency operations. If you think about firestorms, damaging burning poles, line systems, or you have uh, wind storm, you know, blow, blow down your equipment, your assets, lightning storms. And also when you have landslide that exposed, for example, gas transmission line, you know, that are in danger. So what do we do in those challenging situations? Well, we have problems sending people into the area to assess the situation. And oftentimes we don't have enough information to mobilize our resources to get to the locations that we need to uh, look at the damages and so on. And oftentimes, we don't even have the relevant information to communicate to our customers or to the regulators what's going on, right? And when there are a lot of location impacts simultaneously, you run out of resources quickly. 
So those are really challenges that we do and deal with every day, right? So we're gonna run a video and show you what a simulated fire looks like and with integrated technology, what it can do for us. A wildfire breaks out along a power line. I'm an electric utility operator and I'm alerted that a wildfire has broken out near an important transmission corridor. The challenge is how to share the data between different entities in the community and manage the event all from the control center. You notice multiple wildfires on the Esri GIS map close to the important transmission corridor and as per standard operating procedure, the line is de-energized. The pop-up shows real-time data updates indicating the line is out of service and receiving no power input. This can be confirmed through the Pi Corsite display. An hour later, I receive an alert from the Cal Fire Department that the fire has subsided. But I question, is it safe to send out a field crew? Is there any damage to the asset? And ultimately, is it safe to energize the line now? So I make a request to AeroVironment for line inspection from a drone. The videos are updated onto Esri GIS, and I can now click the pop-up and view the video of the transmission corridor for any damage. It is clear from the video that the fire has indeed subsided and the asset is undamaged. Through data sharing, this situational awareness can be provided to all of the stakeholder groups in the community. Now, I can make the informed decision to energize the line, returning power to customers faster, and from the Pi Corsite display, I can confirm that operations are now back to normal. Awesome, Patrick. All right. Well, as you can see in the video, that with an integrated platform of technology like this, using drone, using real-time data, advanced imagery, and geographic information system that are integrated into the data, data layer. Our operators now have the most relevant information to, mo to make the most informed decision in operating our power systems. Right. With that, we also help to bring our people in, into the operating areas more, more safely and we can operate our system more reliably because of that, because we can restore power quickly. And but most importantly, we have more information available to us to inform our customers, and also to improve our coordination response with fire agencies and other agencies to work together to respond to these major emergencies around us. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> uh, I guess the challenge is great, uh, but if you have a challenge out in the audience, I'd appreciate you bring him to Chris and I, and we can try to help solve him. Chris, thank you for your partnership and your help. Great examples to look at now moving from enterprise into community, because if you're looking at critical infrastructure, that was just power lines. What if it's transportation? What if it's a port? What if it's a critical facility or a gas line, and you need to share this data? It moves us into our community discussion. And connecting the community is really quite interesting for us. But you know, there's all this talk about the cloud. I thought I'd leverage what we're doing with this missile and talk about space. Could you roll the video, please? One of our uh, projects, we've got an experiment going up at the International Space Station. And basically the growth chamber we're measuring a little, really simple uh, uh, plant, uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. And they send one of these products to the International Space Station, and then uh, they get data that's coming from space. And they have other exolabs, uh, one as a control, maybe in their company, and then they have others that they distribute throughout the country, and different schools work with them. What happens when you remove gravity as one of the forces of nature, and how will that plant grow on station versus what happens in their classroom? This is what you see in the classroom, a carbon dioxide sensor, luminosity sensor, along with temperature and humidity sensors. We take that, we throw that up on the OSI cloud, and the students get real-time streaming data back to the station, school to school, as well as school to station. So we get this data coming from different exolabs, and then we put it together to basically compare. So I'm sure every student would love spending time on it and would love actually like working with it, making charts, comparing values, trends. Real-time data, 
Yeah, how do you describe it? I guess the best thing to do is just take a snapshot of, of a young student when their eyes get wide and their mouth goes agape because they've literally seen a phenomenon right in front of them. Magnitude is giving the students the opportunity to build something and work with real-time data that's coming from space. In 10 years, when they sit down and get interviewed, they'll say, it was the exolot that kind of drawn me to STEM. Really cool, two key things there. Number one, Pi Systems collecting data off the, the space station. And number two, building a community around students to innovate around IoT technologies and share that data. The question I'd like to think about is where can you find that? And that's where we've launched the marketplace. This is the place where as cool applications you saw from Emerson, you saw from Rockwell, what about working with Esri, these are where you can find them. And I encourage you throughout the show to find a digital interface to work with our marketplace. Uh, one that I want to feature right now is another community sharing, not from ground to space, but how about from Berkeley to Singapore? So please, could you roll that video? If you wanted to save the world, you couldn't pick a better place to start than with energy. We've all seen office buildings at night, you drive past them, the building's completely empty, but all the lights are on. Buildings consume about 70% of the world's electricity, about one third of the world's energy, and they're doing that very inefficiently. You've got air conditioning systems, lighting, water, wastewater, heating, boilers, chillers. Each of these building systems is managed separately, if it's managed at all. To try to change this, an alliance of six government agencies, three universities, and several industries created a building inside a building where they can control and monitor with precision all of the various factors to create new control schemes and best practices. It's taking this research further than any other organization. It's a very well-funded program that uh, involves uh, a couple dozen faculty from Berkeley and from institutions in Singapore. Their work on fault detection, smarter maintenance, and energy efficiency, it's going to change the world. In an academic environment, it is very difficult to share data among researchers. So that led us, of course, to the easy conclusion that we need an industrial strength database that will be the central element of what we do. And it was a natural to, to, to build uh, our architecture around Pi. The data somehow have to go from the physical world into the database, bridging that gap from the sensors from various vendors, connecting them and ultimately feeding them into Pi. And I bridges that gap very nicely. Okay, and not only bridges this gap, but it also provides a layer of control and visualization that is very important. I can see the probability of reducing energy consumption by a large factor. We have shown how to cut it in half without sacrificing any of the basic field building, building performance. And that's, I think, it's huge. Excellent. As we build out the community, we look at those examples, but I'm going to leave you with a challenge. The challenge is really going to be something around you changing your world around sustainability. And hopefully, through the journey we've just gone through, you can take away some ideas that you can take home on how you can do this. But let me set the challenge up. Number one, if you look at the EPA and the study they've looked at North America and the Im impact on the environment around sustainability, it's about 3 billion tons of CO2 a year in that footprint. We have some really passionate folks that work at OSIsoft, and they came and saw this problem and said, what can we do to fix it? Because two-thirds of those systems, people in this room, have Pi systems in it today. And from a social or economic area, we can make this change together. Connect Pi to something, gather that data, or unlock that data, and bring it to a source to do analytics and drive the sustainability. We really think there's an economic opportunity, and here's what Kellogg's has done to do that. Could you please roll the video for Kellogg's? In the area between 99 and 2000, we started what we called an OAE project. At the time, we were in the 40% range, and at the end of that project, we ended up in the 80s. And it opened a lot of eyes in the Kellogg company. So, 2005, they set some energy targets up, 10-year uh, energy targets for 2015. And Pi was the uh, natural go-to for us. Uh, I love the, the Pi infrastructure and the way we can justify projects. Justify and also on the back end validate. In the years since 2005, 
our plant is saving $3.3 million annually, and we've claimed $1.8 million in rebates. And those rebate unlocks don't come without data. They don't, you can't just say, well, we thought we saved. So the system that we got in place unlocks that. Here's an example of a HVAC project we did. We discovered that we were spending an awful lot of steam, heat and hot water, to cool it right back down. So we took control of these and retrofitted the controls on these units. So the left-hand trend was the year before, the right-hand trend was, was the year that we measured it, and we calculated that we saved over $40,000 in a week. And we didn't even put that on the radar. So that's what having smart guys digging back through the data does for you. Another project we did was a boiler heat recovery. We actually have a problem in one of our boilers that we can't recover heat off because we're getting sooting. We got a leak in the boiler. Um, and you can let that stuff go, but it's easier to make the argument when you say, hey, fellas, if you're really interested in another $75,000 a year, we need to fix that boiler. You know, that's what the data does for us. What a great example of outscoping, starting with OEE and then taking on the challenge of the socio and the economic returns. It wouldn't have been successful unless they had those economic returns. So please share those challenges back with us and we'd love to see what you've done to help us around energy and help yourselves. I hope you've enjoyed this journey through our strategy. Uh, also the insights on the industry. Uh, I hope you enjoy the conference and thank you so much for being part of our community and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.